And without any further ado, everyone welcome Dan O'Brien. <laughs> Hello. It must be reading day because I'm wearing my one nice shirt. That's <laughs> um, only mildly wrinkled at this point. Uh, I'm going to, during, for, before my reading, I'm going to say lots of sappy things that will embarrass Wyatt, but I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, this is my 10th tenth, tenth summer in 16 years. I'm back there looking like I'm 14 years old. Uh, when I first came here, and um, just so many meaningful moments and hours and days have been spent, not just at Sewanee, but in this room. Um, so I'm so grateful for that time and, and hearing, uh, not just meeting the writers, but hearing what people are writing and, and, and uh, just growing from the, the vulnerability that, that people share uh, here. So I'm going to share some vulnerability. Um, this is, I, I'm so admiring of, of people that can get up here and give a craft talk and lecture and just talk uh, for 45 minutes and say brilliant things. And, and uh, many of those people have already given lectures like that, but I have to write it down. Uh, so I will be reading. Um, and uh, as I've done the last few years, it's a bit of a hybrid between personal essay and uh, craft talk. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll uh, bear with me. A little bit. This is called Surviving Conflict. I am often confused, having been abused as a child, as to why I have chosen to spend my life writing about conflict. You would think that as an adult I would want to run as far away from conflict as possible, and in many ways I have done just that. I work alone, when my five-year-old tantrums, thankfully a rare event and almost always for a good reason, I want nothing more than to resolve things quickly or better still to prevent her upset with more supple parenting. I am plainly soft-spoken. When I teach, I try not to persuade. I have been accused of appeasement in several arenas. At dinner parties, also at the Swanee Inn during meals, I do, <laughs> I do my best to make sure to help everybody get along. A psychotherapist would say, as full disclosure many have said, that I choose to spend my life writing about conflict precisely because of the conflict of my childhood. I'm compulsively striving to control, even to master, an abstracted conflict in the hope of transcending not only the humi humiliation of past abuse, but the echoing, damning directives of self-abuse in my psyche. All this is true. But as usual, the explanation does not solve the problem. Those of us who write scripts talk of an inciting incident, the precise point in our first five or 10 pages where and when the conflict that is our story begins. Perhaps it's fair to think of this section of my lecture as an elucidation of a few inciting incidents, at least elements, in the ongoing conflict of my own personal dramaturgy. Like most of us, I believe my parents could have used some therapy themselves. Uh, in my opinion, and I've had to think, I've had to think long and hard about this, my mother suffered from borderline personality disorder, uh, pointing at someone uh, who does not have borderline personality <laughs> disorder. <laughs> but we were discussing it in the abstract. Um, Borderline personality disorder. She never got herself diagnosed, but she checks enough boxes. Splitting, that is black and white thinking, and devil god characterizing of her loved ones, a ferocious if not delusional and therefore self-fulfilling fear of abandonment, uncontrollably intense emotions disproportionate to events and situations, all of which leading to unstable and chaotic relationships. Borderline people, to be flip about it, are dramatic. Theirs is a disorder of perceiving conflict, and they overreact with such resentment and rage that they typically end up creating the very conflict that so terrorizes them. If you were raised by a borderline parent, then you have come back from the war that has survived into adulthood, hyper-attentive to even the merest hint of an incipient quarrel. You are anxious. You are maybe a writer. <laughs> you understand in your heart in your very cells that the nature of conflict is fascinatingly, perhaps impossibly relative. That is, if conflict makes any sense at all. 
If I were his therapist, and he's never had one, I would diagnose my father as a paranoid personality type, comorbid with schizoid personality disorder and autism, autistic spectrum disorder. So he was a lot of fun. And, uh, and yet, he was the less frightening parent because most of the time he simply ignored us, reading his science fiction and fantasy novels and watching TV. Living with him consisted of long bouts of boredom punctuated by explosions of shouting and swearing and walls punched and dogs kicked. He only ever hit his children, to be fair, a few times. But at least we knew where we stood with the man as far away as we could manage to stand, or sitting in other rooms with doors closed and books in our faces, for by avoiding him, we hoped we could avoid his conflict. Both of my parents also exhibited florid symptoms of depression and anxiety, just to round out the sunny picture here. The anger of their children, it should almost go without saying, was forbidden. Like a victim of Stockholm Syndrome, it was easy for me as a child to sympathize with my parents, as they were both evidently abused in their childhoods, but they didn't talk much about all that, or at all, in my father's case. My mother's abuse involving a violent alcoholic mother, a workaholic father, and a schizophrenic brother who'd been fostered away to a home in Alberta, Canada, uh, became the stuff of legend in our home. I've long suspected, no, intimated, that my mother was also sexually abused, but I doubt I will ever know the truth about that. They weren't Catholics or Mormons, but my parents had a lot of kids anyway, uh, six, six of us. Someone said to me years ago, oh, they must have really liked to fuck. And I've been haunted by that ever since. Um, <laughs> six of us in itself uh, abusive to have six kids considering our circumstances. And while we siblings got along well enough, we splintered and scattered into our adulthoods like the survivors of a cult or a totalitarian regime, wanting little or nothing to do with each other because our memories were too distressing and the old ways of seeing and being ourselves in each other's presence too easily resumed. It took me a long time to understand why the theater had drawn me inexorably toward it. Here was a family to replace my family. Here inside the theater, my new family could engage in conflicts of story that would resolve artfully via the alchemy of collaboration. Of course, collaboration with actors, directors, designers, dramaturgs, producers creates conflict behind the scenes. Discord in the rehearsal room, what's my objective, but more on that later. The pressures of rewrites and workshop and approaching press night. If we failed as a company, with lackluster reviews, anemic ticket sales, I would feel that I had failed personally and existentially, and the feeling was dimly but deeply familiar. I always feel like Mark Rubio when I <laughs> grab a beverage during a reading. So what had my childhood taught me of conflict? That it is pervasive and intractable, that its origins are ancient if not apocryphal, and its only resolution is forbearance or martyrdom, both strategies essentially of avoidance. As a young playwright, I knew conflict was crucial. All my teachers taught me so, but I wasn't always successful at writing it. At their best, my first plays were absurd, approaching tragedy. At their worst, they constituted a theater of cruelty, even, God forbid, the anti-play. For all my sensitivity to conflict in my life, my plays were not conflicted enough. I was, like most sane people, perhaps more than sane people, conflict averse. I had yet to learn that conflict can be survived. The teachers will teach you that uh, engaging characters are forced into conflict by what, they've, uh, by what they've done or what's done to them, and that they do not struggle to achieve, to change in combat with the wants and needs of other characters and other forces on the stage with them right now, then nothing much will happen. The drama does not occur. For while conflict in the theater is made perceptible on the page by dialogue and stage directions, conflict itself is the substance of drama. Dramatists invent, build, structure, conflict. We are conflict engineers. 
these same teachers may teach you that there are three categories of conflict. One, the interpersonal, the most graspable conflict for the characters, for the characters, the dramatist and the audience, because it is social and at least partially externalized. Two, the intra personal or inner conflict, which is usually illuminated by monologue or revealed in fractured moments of the interpersonal conflict. And three, conflict between characters and the world at large. Puritan New England, climate change, white supremacy. You can, if you want to sound like you have an MFA, call this extra personal conflict. Inevitably, one conflict uh, dominates. If this is a play about mainly inner struggles and is probably a monologue or a one-person show. If external or cultural conflict is the play's reason for being, then it's agitprop or self-consciously political theater. Or it's not a play at all, but a blockbuster movie involving armies, superheroes, dragons. Most modern American theater, for better or worse, and for lots of reasons, primarily is is primarily concerned with the conversable struggles of close relationships. Regardless of its focus, any compelling play is composed of many strains of struggle and concert feeding and enforcing and intensifying each other. Inner conflicts pitch your characters into conflicts with other characters. Likewise, the world around them influences your characters' private and social conflicts and sometimes palpable, even subliminal ways. At the conclusion of the psychologically well-made play, the resolution of the exterior conflicts has resolved the interior. If theirs is a truly happy ending, then your characters will retire from the field of battle that is the stage, blissfully unconflicted in all spheres of life, at least for the time being. Actors will talk and talk, apologies to the actors here, of, the, of their intentions, or more serviceably, their objectives in the scene from moment to moment, or beat to beat inside the skins of their characters as they pursue the prize of their want or need across a rope course of choices made and actions taken. The other characters are, of course, likewise impelled by their own inner conflicts into conflicts with each other as together these actions braid into the action and events of a play. For all that, conflicts will soon bore the audience if the playwright hasn't instilled in us a vivid sense of why the conflict matters. So despite my distaste for the word, because it sounds so financial, we must talk of stakes, of risk and cost, of the propulsive value and captivating power of a prize won or lost, and how conflict without stakes is mere spectacle. In drama and comedy, in the spectrum between, the stakes are life and death, yes, but also particular, because each of us has different ideas about what is profoundly threatening and desirable. It is one of our most subtle skills as playwrights to be able to convey the subjective nature of what's at stake. And the character doesn't need to always understand why they do what they do. In fact, they probably shouldn't. This awareness is most dramatic when it's hard won in the sweat and froth of conflict. But we in the audience need to incrementally learn what the playwright knows, the reasons for this behavior and why these reasons matter. When structuring a play that is shaping conflict, it can be helpful, some would say critical, to think in terms of a protagonist or protagonists, plural if we must. Love stories of any kind are dual protagonist stories in which our main characters share the same objective, that of consummation. Though inner and external conflicts, not to mention conflicts with secondary and tertiary characters, will undoubtedly, should undoubtedly get in the way. Multi-protagonist plays, more elegantly called ensemble plays, are the more difficult to write because they tend to bloat or dissipate with characters and their conflicts, rambling and ranging every which way. Writing an ensemble play requires the deft knitting together of equally important conflicts so that they escalate and resonate and culminate with each other. An encompassing external conflict, perhaps represented by a very real brick and mortar container like an ancestral estate with a cherry orchard in Russia, for example, will help the ensemble play cohere. The modern American theater seems to have largely abandoned the antagonist. Playwrights may write a relative or structural antagonist, if you will, a less sympathetic character whose wants and needs and therefore actions conflict with what our protagonist is after. But the villain of old is often nowhere to be found. 
The neoliberal theater seems to believe that an antagonist is simply a protagonist we have not yet understood. But it can be useful as a playwright to remember and to explore, if not exploit, the truth that dramatic conflict is in its purest form, the depiction of the struggle between good and evil, us against them, protagonist against antagonist, Beowulf and Grendel, Cain and Abel, Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty. Sorry to bring it down a little bit. There's, theirs is the essential conflict. If we can believe in an enemy, then our attention will be total. Because in the end, we all want to win, at least to survive. The antagonist wants to win too, but we don't care. Our objective in the audience is to vicariously achieve a resolution that will feel like justice, maybe even peace in our time. I have never been to war. I come from a long line of at least physical cowards. The only warrior I know of in my bloodline is one John O'Brien, one of multitudes, who came to Manhattan fleeing the famine in Ireland and promptly exchanged his rags for a Union uniform, a hot meal, and a rifle, and a train ticket south. I don't actually know if he fought or if he peeled potatoes behind the mess tent. All I know is that he survived as evidenced by my existence here today. This is all a preamble to my confession that I feel like an imposter. I have been invited to deliver this a version of this lecture on September 11th of all days at the US Air Force Academy in Colorado. And clearly I will not deserve to be there. <laughs> I do not in many ways deserve to be here with you now discussing as I'm about to the horrors and exhilarations of war. While I have never been to war, I have spent more than a decade writing about war, albeit through the eyes and ears, through the protagonist, you could say, of a combat journalist named Paul Watson. After hearing him interviewed on NPR's Fresh Air, I emailed Watson, or as I call him now that we've become friends, Paul, seeking vaguely a creative collaboration. I didn't really know why I was reaching out to him. All I knew is that I felt haunted by his story of feeling haunted and then investigating why and what we might, with our writing, do about our hauntings, would in some way constitute our collaboration going forward, should he reply. Thankfully, and with great consequence for me at least, he did. This was 2007, and Paul had already spent almost 20 years reporting from war zones around the world, beginning in South Africa during apartheid, followed by the Somali Civil War and the Rwandan Genocide and the Balkans and our forever wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and lastly, before his reluctant retirement a few years ago, Syria. At the heart of Paul's story, from which I have so far derived two plays, two poetry collections, an opera and a failed TV pitch, is a photograph he took of the body of a US Army Ranger being desecrated in the streets of Mogadishu in 1993. This photograph, which received a Pulitzer Prize, resulted in the withdrawal of US troops from Somalia and emboldened and ascend in Al-Qaeda with the lesson that a single well-placed atrocity, and more importantly, images of that atrocity, could defeat the world's greatest superpower. Paul claims that just before he took this photograph, he heard the voice of the dead soldier speak to him, both in his head and out. If you do this, I will own you forever. Paul took the picture anyway. And every day since, he lives in fear that he will be punished drastically and ultimately for this moral transgression. When he was stoned and stabbed by a mob in Mosul in 2004, when he nearly succumbed to a bout of septicemia recently, he felt that judgment and probably justice had come at last. But the paradox of trauma and guilt aside, why was Paul drawn toward war to begin with? Because, perhaps because his father was a World War II vet who survived D-Day only to die of polycystic kidney disease when Paul was two years old. And because Paul was born with just one hand, he could never go to war himself. Probably his brain chemistry was, for whatever reason, naturally depressed, and the thrill of war provided a dopamine hit that made him feel at least temporarily normal. 
Whatever the cause, the young Paul Watson had an instinctive, desperate need to experience conflict, in this case by observing it and, and telling others about it, first as a freelance war tourist in his college years, then as a self-avowed adrenaline junkie on the payroll of Hemingway's Toronto Star, then the LA Times. Paul has never been ashamed to admit that he finds war thrilling. Stories of war, too, can be thrilling, as we all know. Most war stories excite by lying about war, erasing chaos and carnage by hyperbolizing glory and valor. But even the truthful war story thrills by conveying how the awful awareness of violence casts reality in a sharper relief, revealing to us a world more beautiful because it is more fragile and lethal. As Tim O'Brien writes in How to Tell a True War Story, something I had the good luck to hear him read a few years ago at Sewanee in this very room. A true war story is never about war. It's about the special way that dawn spreads out on a river when you know you must cross the river and march into the mountains and do things you are afraid to do. I wanted to tell Paul Watson's story of a man haunted by war because I was haunted by my childhood. Survivors of child abuse often describe their childhood homes as war zones, and their emergent psychologies as post-traumatically stressed into any variety of disorders. When I began working with Paul, I was physically free of my family, but terrified in my freedom, that I was in some way fundamentally cursed, that my escape could never be countenanced by the cosmos, and therefore, like Paul Watson, my judgment and probably justice was fast approaching. I feared that I was owned by the trauma of my childhood, just as Paul was owned by his photo of that soldier. During a talk back after the, the performance of my first play about Paul, a discussion in which Paul and I had been rehashing much of the trauma in the play, a somewhat exasperated New Yorker raised his hand and asked us both, but are you happy now? I believe Paul answered Socratically, happy about what? <laughs> which made everybody laugh uneasily. I said, I said something sad about how life will always present you with a new conflict if you, you're just patient enough. What I didn't feel able to talk about publicly at the time was that my wife had been recently diagnosed with breast cancer and was at home in California in the middle of her extensive treatment. And within a few weeks, I would go home and find myself diagnosed with cancer too. I worried for a long time, I still worry sometimes, that our cancers came as retribution for the transgression of writing about Paul's transgression of taking a picture of war. The traumatized are desperate for connections. Paul feels significantly responsible for 9-11. The pulverized World Trade Center coated Jessica's apartment in Battery Park in dust, and surely despite HEPA filters, we were inhaling the poison for months. It was September 11th, 2015, when just Jessica discovered her lump. But of course, I'll never know. Perhaps the cancers were retribution for the transgression of leaving my family. I'd broken the fifth commandment, after all, or is it the sixth? Though in truth, they left me, or it was mutual. I'd written so many ugly things about child abuse and war over the years. I wanted nothing more now than to repent, to renounce what I'd written, even never to write again, so long as I could be forgiven and survive. So, though I have never been to war, I have been treated for a metastatic yet treatable colon cancer, and have now lived two and a half years post-treatment without evidence of its presence in my body. I am classified as a survivor. Of course, one can survive many things in addition to war, concentration camps and earthquakes, for example. Uh, many of you in the audience have survived bereavements, accidents, assaults, but the cancer war analogy is common, probably because cancer is common. Four out of 10 of us will receive a cancer diagnosis at some point in our lives, while only 8% of us are military veterans and only about half of a percent of Americans serve, are serving in the military at any given time. 
But the bellicose motif, metaphors are abundant and cliched. We battle cancer. Anybody with cancer is a warrior, an almost classical hero, certainly the protagonist in, a, in the highest of stakes drama. And cancer is the, uh, the arch antagonist, a humanized yet inhumanly cruel adversary we must annihilate at all cost. Some of the grosser similarities between cancer and war have to do with the horrors of the damaged body, the humiliations of tubes and fluids, and the mutilations of life-extending and sometimes life-saving surgeries. Then there is the bombardment of radiation and chemotherapy like chemical warfare, in which surgical masks are sometimes worn like Great War gas masks, defending a compromised immunity from the mustard gas of everyday microbes and viruses. Cancer treatment is overall a long march. In its final months, like trench warfare, we develop a siege mentality. We are being held hostage and tortured. And when cancer, or at least treatment, is over, if we are lucky enough to return or escape from war, like a veteran, like a refugee, we find ourselves living in the aftermath with some degree of post-traumatic stress disorder. We, too, experience flashbacks and nightmares, repetitive and distressing images, physical sensations that trigger, like a mild summer cold reminding us of the sandbagged limbs of the sickbed, the frazzled, numb extremities of neuropathy, or an after-dinner mint like a Madeleine moment sucking us back into the months when incessant minting was required to counteract the nauseating taste of our chemo-scoured tongues. Despite our survival, we wonder why the bullet of cancer hit us in the first place and what we could have done to avoid it, so we avoid it now. Anything vaguely carcinogenic, naturally, but thinking magically, we avoid also certain people and places, music and colors and styles of clothing that somehow remind us of the cancer. We isolate ourselves, popping mental corners with our defenses drawn, hypervigilant always to any possible symptom of recurrence. Just ask my mensch of an oncologist whom I email regularly a couple times a week regarding anything that feels slightly amiss. We would like to move house, but can't afford to. We leave the country for a few months, thanks to my wife's latest acting gig. PTSD from cancer, of course, creates conflict with coworkers, with friends and families, lovers and spouses, through ir irritability and outsized, even borderline uh, overreactions of anger. If I were more reckless, I'd reveal more here. Let us just say that survivors fight with those they love because we cannot very satisfyingly fight with cancer. We may have survived, at least for the time being, yet we find ourselves making messes of our rescued lives. Many survivors of both war and cancer may succumb to the life and death intra-personal intra conflict that is suicide. Paul Watson has often said that when his PTSD was at its untreated worst, he chose to return and again, again and again to war zones in a half passive attempt to get himself killed. He lacked the courage, he said, to do it for himself. Thankfully, my brain is wired more for effortful anxiety than despair. When I was deep in the trenches of my treatment, a doctor ticking through bullet points asked if I was experiencing any thoughts of self-harm and I was Baffled, no, no. I nearly shouted, I want to live. My wife and I employ the cancer war analogy all the time. Sometimes we wish aloud that we were survivors of an actual war because we suppose at least military veterans aren't terrified that they could be redeployed to hell at any moment. But of course, that's not how PTSD works for anybody. In our most private, if not shameful moments, we, we may even miss the war because we seem to know then what mattered. This moment, the love given and received within this moment, the beauty and pleasure to be absorbed with no thought or emotion greater than gratitude. We desired then only to survive the conflict of cancer so that we might inhabit more such moments in the future, any future. And when by some miracle of medicine or fortune or God, we find we have survived months, then years, 
post-treatment into a future in which we are living, I am living in Hampstead in London, and I'm receiving in the post a literary journal from Boston containing poems I, write, I wrote four years ago while my wife laid in bed at noon post-mastectomy, where I go running in the afternoon in a heath not unlike the fire trails of the domain of Sewanee, another time and place I was happy where I am collecting our pigeon-chasing, boisterous, somehow almost six-year-old daughter in her pale blue gingham uniform at the wrought iron gate of a centuries-old church, I feel that I have been delivered back into the world, but the world is changed. Or I am, a race apart, only another survivor can understand where I've been and where I am and where I may or may not be going, I feel stronger. If I've survived cancer, then surely I can survive a rejection, a review. <laughs> Other times I know I'm letting myself down. Having survived all that, why am I muddled again by the old concerns, the petty worries, the frontal lobe? Why is the world less beautiful again? Is it because I feel safe? Now, there are countless reasons why the cancer war analogy rankles and even offends, and here are a few. Nobody enlists for cancer. The vast majority of soldiers are young, while most cancer patients are middle-aged or older, though, of course, it's not just soldiers who are traumatized by war. The cancer patient is not required to commit state-sanctioned state murder. This an, uh, analogy also implies that those who have survived cancer have fought harder or better been more tactical or religious or positive than those who have not survived. It is only a further leap to believe that those who have developed cancer must have done something in the first place to deserve it. When I was newly diagnosed, a Russian acupuncturist in Venice Beach, uh, for example, informed me that my cancer was caused by my unexpressed anger, my conflict aversion. I told her to shove it <laughs> and slammed her door on my way out. Maybe such victim blaming is forgivable in reference to dedicated longtime smokers or Instagrammers on vacation in Chernobyl or, or <laughs> Fukushima. But a quick tour of the pediatric cancer ward should cure anybody of the notion that cancer makes much sense. Like war, the causes of cancer are manifold and overdetermined and mysterious and any way more complex than any one of our singular lives. So the metaphor is flawed, yet it is useful and compelling. I at least feel that I've been to war, and I've come back with new knowledge. What should I do then with my new knowledge? Or more um, germane to my subject today, how did the conflict of cancer change how I write my plays? A probably uh, belated disclaimer, I don't know if any of my ideas regarding conflict and story have developed in any substantive way, or if I've simply come through the fire, so to speak, with my aesthetics annealed. Perhaps I'm simply the writer I was always going to become with enough time and trauma. But here's what I do differently. I try to write as honestly and explicitly as I can about not just war and cancer, but trauma broadly. I choose to engage with the ugliness of my subjects because I know it's not ugliness I'm after, but the high relief beauty of Tim O'Brien's dawn spreading out across a river, the river of time we are, all, we are walking beside, knowing that eventually every one of us will have to march into the mountains and do the thing we are afraid to do. I wish to write now about only that which is high stakes for me. That is, what matters to me and what matters is that, is that which scares me, infuriates me, disturbs me. What matters is what I'm trying to figure out about life while there is life. My object objective, as the protagonist writer, has never been clearer. And I know what doesn't matter like professional striving and competitiveness, because when I could only climb the stairs maybe once a day, when sitting up in bed took too much effort, I didn't care what others thought of me, and I try to retain that feeling. I write slower now because what's the rush? I write as fast as I can because what are we all waiting for? I don't write for anybody other than my wife and daughter, 
because I know it's entirely possible I won't be around to see what I've written, produced, or published, or in any way received. A deadline means something different now. I feel braver. Before cancer, I was researching this, a play about the Sandy Hook shooting, but I couldn't face it. Now I am writing the play because how can I not as a father with a child in America? And it's distressing. It is a choice I would like to turn away to write about less difficult subjects or even sometimes to stop writing altogether. Some primitive part of me doesn't want to be standing here delivering this lecture today as if simply saying aloud the words metastatic and retribution could somehow invite more trauma. But another thing I know now is that nobody can hide. If you take my advice, if any of this has been advice, I don't know if your playwriting will improve. I doubt your plays will become more marketable. <laughs> a, lot of people, a lot of people won't care about your trauma. The world is crowded with trauma, after all. Or they won't care for the way you tell it. Human beings can only bear so much reality in their entertainment. So the reality of any punishing conflict will always be a hard sell. As I alluded to earlier, I've pitched only one television series in my career. Paul Watson and I concocted it together, and we called it The Zone, which is, I acknowledge, acknowledge now in retrospect, of course, a fad, low-carb diet. <laughs> it took us a while to realize that. Um, our zone endeavored to tell the documentary style story of Western journalists covering the war zone of Syria. With each new season, we imagined our setting shifting around the globe to different war zones. We spent months preparing, developing a treatment of characters and conflicts and storylines, but in the end, our pitch failed. And it failed uh, to sell for a variety of reasons, not least of which is that the war in Syria has already failed as a narrative for the American audience. Just when the infotainment conglomerates thought they had a protagonist in the Syrian National Front, al-Nusra, al -Nusra, or al-Qaeda in Syria, arrived on the scene and confused everybody's sympathies. Then ISIS, not to mention Russia, the Syria conflict was and remains a mess, a miasma of antagonists, a story hard to understand and therefore hard to sell. Conflict, if it makes money, and in this country alone, war is a trillion dollar industry, must be presented as starkly us against them. And of course, I'm not just talking about entertainment. The line between entertainment and politics has been tragically perforated for some time, but our current administration's dominant political gambit is one of brazen deceit. We are lied to regarding the Trump administration's policy of family separation and other brutalities committed against asylum seekers from Mexico, Central and South America. I want to characterize this as a national borderline personality disorder. We are lied to about the presence and virulence in our country of racism and misogyny, trans and homophobia. And we are being told, yet again, another fiction meant to compel and impel us toward yet another war, this time in Iran. As Vice President Pence said to West Point grads this spring, quote, it is a virtual certainty that you will fight on a battlefield for America at some point in your life. In other words, more war is always coming against, quote, radical Islamic terrorists, he said, but also, why not, Venezuela, as, quote, some of you may even be called upon to serve in this hemisphere. Also at West Point, Bush II said much the same in 2002, setting the scene for the disastrous and ongoing drama of our felonious invasion of Iraq. Johnson lied about the Gulf of Tonkin, McKinley about the explosion of the USS Maine, which some of our older faculty may remember. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I told myself I wasn't going to make that joke. And, um, it's ruined the tone, I'm sorry. Hist uh, history is rife with the weaponization of humanity's biological predile predilection 
or high stakes drama. This is why Paul Watson took his photograph that day in Mogadishu in 1993. The Pentagon was lying when they denied on numerous occasions that similar desecrations of American soldiers had been occurring in the weeks prior. And they were, going, they were able to get away with this because Paul hadn't provided any photographic evidence. Yet, if the true story of what was happening on the ground and in the air in Mogadishu had been known, then the US intervention in Somalia would have made little sense to the common sense voter. Policy would have changed, probably lives would have been saved. So Paul told the truth with his art, with his photograph, which is why I believe that despite his guilt, he did the right thing. A little more coffee. I, I want to end with um, an evocation, evocation of the most intangible, arguably, arguably most vital kind of conflict in the theater between the play you write and the society you live in. I, I learned this early, and like many valuable lessons, it begins in humiliation. I was telling some joke over and over, as children do, and my father, far above me, snapped, Shut up, Danny. It's not funny anymore. Not so many years later, after my older brother Chris tried to kill himself, we would all eat dinner together every night, something we rarely did before, because mother had gleaned from her self-help books that children need a stable family unit. So our dining room table had become nightly a stupefying lie of normality. For the truth was that mother despised how father chewed too much and too loudly, how he hunched and picked at the iceberg lettuce with his fork. My brother Chris's lubricious mouth sounds turned her stomach too. Father, for his part, ignored mother down there at the foot of the table, unless it was to ask without looking, where'd you get this meat? Despite the fact that mother often said she'd only given us food poisoning once, when she and we were very young, so what was the big deal? and to ridicule her for saying something idiotic. He'd shake his head with disgust if she forgot yet again to serve with the chicken his cranberry sauce, sloughed out of its tin can and sliced with a butter knife. Only father liked the stuff. Peter ate it, but he ate anything. Pam, home from college, would just sit there inconsequentially nervous. Chris would say nothing while staring at nothing, and nothing was across the table where I would be sitting. So he stared at me, or rather threw me, at the beige wallpaper with the miserably hateful expression of the incarcerated, answering any question lobbed his way with one word, one syllable if he could manage it. A thatch of dark chest hairs sprouted in the gaping collar of his eyes up. The seat of his pants or summer shorts stuck lightly to the seat of the wooden chair whenever he fidgeted or stood, and we would snicker behind his back such execrable hygiene, which shouldn't have been funny, because if he wasn't washing his self or his clothes, then chances were good he was considering suicide again. Carrie chirping beside mother, baby Timmy on mother's other side, refusing to eat wisely, and all the while, I was doing everything I could to undermine our father with my jokes at his expense, especially when he had just barked something cruel about ethnic minorities or women or gays or his wife and children. And the closer I could cut to the bone, the better and the funnier. I made the long table laugh or Twitter at least, the whole captive audience of our unhappy brood. Even my father had to chuckle sometimes, as if he hadn't understood himself to be the butt of my joke. Or he did understand, but didn't have the wit to retaliate. I would play the fool to his meat-headed leer at the dining room table, but also in my life going forward, because he's right, it isn't funny anymore. Thanks. <laughs>